It's a Wednesday evening devotional time. If you will, open your Bibles to Acts chapter 5. We're going to start with verse 22, read through verse 24, and then uh, we're going to kind of back up and see what was going on. Well, you're finding Acts chapter 5. I'm going to go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we love you and thank you so much for your many wonderful blessings. God, you've just been an amazing God. You've blessed us in so, so many ways, but most of all, you've blessed us with your son, Jesus Christ, that died on the cross of Calvary to shed his blood that we might be adopted into your family, to be a uh, part of your family, to be able to call you Father. And God, as a Father, you have uh, protected us. You have been such an awesome God, and I want you to have the credit, the praise, the honor, the glory for all of that, and I just want to say thank you. Fathers, we've opened your word. God, would you just please reveal unto us your word, an exciting part of the New Testament as Peter, when uh, the apostles were being persecuted, uh, threatened uh, God for proclaiming the gospel of Jesus Christ. Let us learn uh, from the revealing of your word. Uh, teach us tonight, Father, what your word would have us to hear. Uh, for the listeners that will be hearing your word, pray that it would penetrate into our hearts, into our minds. Uh, God, that you would take it, that it would go through what we are being taught socially, what we may have been bought into in the last few weeks and months. And God, reveal to us what your word teaches us that we might hear and understand from you and from your word. Bless your word. Anoint me as your speaker to speak your divine word. In Jesus' precious holy name I pray. Amen. Acts chapter 5, verse 22 said, When the officers came and they did not find them in the prison, they returned and reported. They, when they did not find them, them in the prison was Peter and the apostles. I'll show you that just in a little bit. They had been imprisoned, so them is uh, Peter and uh, the other apostles. Peter's name will be brought up. Uh, the other apostles won't be. But it said, when the officers came and did not find them, Peter and the other apostles, in the prison, they returned and reported, and this is what they reported. Indeed, we found the prison shut securely. The guards were standing outside before the doors, but when we opened them, that is the doors, we found no one inside. And my Bible has an exclamation point at the end of that statement, they were amazed. The doors were shut, the prison doors were shut, the guards were standing in place, all of the doors were secure, but Peter and the apostles are gone. Verse 24, now when the high priest, the captain of the temple, the chief priest, there's a group of these, there's a high priest, there's a captain of the temple, and the chief priest heard these things. What things? That the prison doors are shut securely, the guards are standing outside, all of the doors of the prison are still secure, guards are in place, but there's no one inside. When they heard these things, listen to this phrase, they wondered what the outcome would be. Now, I believe that they were wondering what the outcome would be with Peter and the apostles. Now, the thought that I want you to think about for just a few moments this evening, they wondered what the outcome would be because they had told Peter and the apostles, enough is enough is enough. We've heard enough about Jesus Christ. I want you to think about for just a moment, and I want this to be a time between you and God and you and God's word, not you and the social media, not you and a group of friends that think alike, but you and God and God alone. About 
probably three months ago, uh, we had a coronavirus that came through. Uh, the coronavirus is still here, not denying that at all. But at that particular time, uh, it was recommended by the governor of the state of Arkansas that there be no congregations, churches included, meeting together. So we had to look for other resources to be able to go ahead and try to worship God in some other form. So we went to the social media and we started putting our church service on Facebook. We started making one calls. We did several different things to try to go ahead and uh, call what, quote, worship God. And there was many pastors that we talked with, I talked with, uh, many people. We wondered what the outcome of this was going to be because we felt like it would never stay that way. But when it opened back up, what would the outcome be? Because many places have it. We had it. Gave out the address. You can mail your money in your tithes and your offerings you can watch the church service on youtube you can watch it on facebook you can hear it on the telephone so what will the outcome be when the uh, time comes when you can meet back together well statistics says that about 40 percent are meeting back together now well, in order for God to get the glory, for God to get the praise, for God to receive the honor and the glory, God, from the very beginning, set a uh, criteria in his word. From the very beginning, God set a time. He called it the Sabbath day in the, or the seventh day in the Old Testament. We celebrate the first day of the week was which was the resurrection of Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. On the first day of the week, we call Sunday. But God has, from the very beginning, set up a time and a place for his people to meet one day of the week at a place that we are to congregate and meet and worship together. So don't let us get in a habit of not meeting together and worshiping God. Because when we get in that habit, it's hard to break that habit. It's hard to get out of that habit. It's easy to get comfortable with not doing it God's way. And I challenge you to look back through the Bible and see how God prepared a place and a day for God's people to meet together and to bring their tithes and their offerings and to bring their gifts together to worship. What were they talking about here in this passage of scripture when it said the high priest, the captain of the temple, the chief priest, they heard these things that everything was secured, the prisons was secure the guards were standing outside the doors were secured but all 12 of these guys were gone and the last phrase they wondered what the outcome would be i wonder where peter i wonder where those 12 guys where they're at well let's go back and read let's start over at about verse 12 and let's see what god was doing before that they were put in prison and what they were doing when this report took place here. In verse 12, it said, Through the hands of these apostles, Peter and these other 11 guys, many signs and wonders were done among the people. Uh, there were some great things that were being done, and it says many signs and many wonders but look why they were being done. They were in all in one accord in Solomon's porch. They were in one accord 
in one place worshiping one God. There's something about meeting in a place of worship and worshiping Jehovah God and praising God in one accord. And there's something about the praise and worship of God. And there was an amazing spirit here the last two Sundays here uh, of meeting and worshiping with God. And verse 13 said, Yet none of the rest dared join them, but the people esteemed them highly. They were afraid to get involved because of the peer pressure around them. And verse 14 said, Believers were increasingly added to the Lord, multitudes of both men and women. God was doing an amazing move of God. So there was some amazing things happening, and this verse here is one of the most intriguing verses that I have ever read, and it said they, that they brought the sick out into the streets and they laid them on beds and couches that at least the shadow of Peter passing by might fall on some of them. Peter had got his life recharged after denying Jesus and after failing so many times and opening his mouth and sticking his foot in his mouth so many times. Peter had, Peter had man, he had, he had really messed up, but now he'd got his act together and he had preached a sermon and 3,000 souls had been saved and he'd walked up to the, uh, headed out to the temple uh, where they met uh, in chapter four, I believe it is, uh, he had headed out, and man, he, him and John, and here was a guy begging for alms, and Peter said, hey, man, we don't have any alms, but in the name of Jesus Christ, get up and walk. This man, I think it was 43 years or 40-plus years that this man had been laying here, and he got up and walked and began to shout and praise and hallelujah to God, and Peter was just on fire for God. Here's a verse that said that they thought that if they could bring the sick out and lay them on the streets, that if they could just get the shadow of Peter to pass by and just the shadow of Peter, they'd be healed. You say, well, here's some things going on here that wasn't in the temple. They was just in the streets. Okay, okay, I'm, I'm buying into it. That's what the Word of God says, but let's keep going. Also, a multitude gathered around from the surrounding cities to Jerusalem, bringing sick people and those who were tormented by unclean spirits and they were all healed but then the high priest he rose up and all those that were with him these are the elite quote religious people uh, the sect of the Sadducees and they were filled with indignation they were just they were jealous they were outraged that because Peter and the apostles they were going against uh, quote the religious sect and they were going against the Roman government they were going against they just did not want Jesus Christ to receive the honor and the glory and the praise and and I, I praise God for the president of the United States to stand up and say churches are essential and they will be opened back up because some of the governors were saying they're not going to be opened back up until there's a vaccine and until you take the vaccine and uh, there was just some ignorant things going along and going out, and, and I praise God uh, for the churches being opened back up. But now the high priest, they'd got jealous, so they laid hands on Peter and the apostles, on all of them, and they put them in the common prison. Now listen to what happened here in verse 19. But at night, an angel of the Lord opened the prison doors, and he brought them out. Now, if we go back to what we read earlier, when they found the prison shut securely, the guards were standing outside, the doors were all shut, nobody was inside, the scripture does not give me any indication how in the world the angel got them out. I don't know. I can't tell you how that happened. But somehow, 12 guys got out of prison and nobody knew it. And all of the doors were still locked and all of the doors were still shut and all of the gates were still locked and prison, prison guards were still standing there. 
How did that happen? I don't know. Scripture didn't tell me. I don't know whether he, I don't know. I mean, it was a miracle of God. There's no other explanation except it was a miracle of God. When we put God where God deserves to be put, God still has some miracles. I've had people to argue this is back in the early New Testament church. God was trying to manifest Jesus in ways to prove that Jesus Christ was the Son of God. I do not believe that. I believe that God is still the same God that he was 2,000 years ago, 6,000 years ago, 10,000 years ago from all eternity and that God can still perform miracles today when we put God where God deserves to be put and when we do God things the way God wants them to be done God still performs miracles I don't know how he got 12 guys out with prison guards still there with all of the gates still locked and all of the people there I don't know how he got them out but he got them out now let's look at what the angel said to Peter. He said, but the angel of the Lord opened the prison doors. He brought them out and he said, go stand in the temple and speak to the people all the words of this life. So why did the angel say go to a specific place called a temple. This is what they had got in trouble for. Yes, they had been out in the streets, but the temple people is who had brought them and put them in jail. Why put them back in the temple? Why put them back in a specific place, a place that God had set aside a place that you know that they're going to be noticed immediately. Why put them there? Why not tell them go into hiding? Why not tell them to go somewhere where you won't be seen and proclaim Jesus? He said, go into the temple, speak to the people all the words of this life. I'll show you in just a minute. And when they heard that, what did they do? They entered the temple early in the morning. They didn't say, let's wait till the traffic dies down. Let's wait until, let's wait. They said they entered the temple early in the morning, but the high priest and those with them came and called the council together with all the elders of the children of Israel and sent to the prison to have them brought and this is where we picked up. And when the officers came, they didn't find them in the prison. They reported them. And then when we get down, I'm going to skip down to verse 25 because we've already read through verse 24. So one came and told them, saying, Look, the men whom you put in prison, they're standing in the temple and they're teaching the people. The guys that you put in prison, who put them in prison? It was the high priest that rose up. It was the guy that would be in the temple, that would be doing the duties of the temple. Why did you go back to the temple? Because the temple, the place of worship, has a special place in the eyes of God. So he said, he is standing in the temple. Look, the men whom you put in prison, they're in the temple right now, and they're teaching the people. Verse 26. Then the captain went with the officers and brought them without violence, for they feared the people lest they should be stoned. And when they brought them, they set them before the council, and the high priest asked them, Did we not strictly command you not to teach in his name? And look, you have filled Jerusalem with your doctrine, and indeed, to bring this man's blood on us. But Peter and the other apostles answered and said, We ought to obey God rather than men. I want you to remember that phrase, Obey God rather than man. I know this was talking about preaching and teaching 
the gospel of Jesus Christ. But I want you to think about, do not get in the comfort zone of allowing yourself to not assemble yourself together to worship the great and awesome God. When we can get out and we can go and do the other things that we do in our everyday lives, when we can go to the Walmarts and we can go to the Lowe's and we can go to the Home Depots, I want you to remember a passage of scripture. And I want you to remember in Isaiah chapter 53, I'm gonna read a couple of verses. Surely he, Jesus, has bore our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. That man died on the cross for us. I pray that you don't shoot the messenger. He's the one that set up the day. He's the one that set up the place. He's the one that said, I want to be worshiped. He's the one that was wounded for our transgressions. He was the one that was smitten by God. He was the one that was bruised for our transgressions. He was the one that was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement for our peace was upon him. By his stripes we are healed. Does he not deserve that? Does he not deserve that time and that place in our lives? Let us pray. Heavenly Father, I love you. I praise you. I thank you, Father, for your many wonderful blessings. And I pray, Father, that we, Father, will humbly come before the throne of grace and give you what you deserve. Not what I think, not what the news media says, but what thus saith the word of God. Bring our hearts before the throne of grace in submission to what your word to what your divine word says to our heart under the submission of your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' precious holy name I pray.